If you clicked on this, you already know I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Neil Barnard in this video. Ever since I made the Aubrey Plaza Got Milk video last year, I had this dream of interviewing Dr. Barnard about so many of the questions that came up during the process of making that video. This interview was so far beyond my expectations. You guys will see Dr. Barnard is such a wealth of information and he is such a clear and effective communicator. We talked about the Got Milk ads, we talked about the Mayo Clinic partnership, we talked about all the different names for the dairy industry and why it's so confusing. Just all the important questions that we're constantly scratching our heads over. So without further ado, let's get right into the interview and I really hope you enjoy it. I am honored to be joined today by Dr. Neil Barnard, who is an MD FACC, an adjunct professor of medicine at the George Washington University School of Medicine in Washington, DC, and president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, AKA PCRM. Dr. Barnard has led numerous research studies investigating the effects of diet on diabetes, body weight, hormonal symptoms, and chronic pain including a groundbreaking study of dietary interventions in type 2 diabetes funded by the National Institutes of Health that paved the way for viewing type 2 diabetes as a potentially reversible condition for so many patients. His latest book is The Power Foods Diet, the breakthrough plan that traps, tames, and burns calories for easy and permanent weight loss, which I'm really excited to discuss with him a bit later. There are so many topics that I could talk to Dr. Barnard about, uh, but today we're really going to be focusing on the machinations of dairy industry marketing. So Dr. Barnard, thank you so much for joining me. Well, it's great to be with you today. I'm so excited to talk to you because so much of what I know about the dairy industry, I learned from listening to you on PCRM's podcast, The Exam Room, uh, specifically a 2018 episode uh, called The Cheese Trap, which is the same name as one of your books, but it was in that episode that I learned about casomorphins, how they make cheese addicting, and also where uh, I first learned about the dairy checkoff in DMI. Uh, since I think that we're going to be talking about DMI a lot today, could you just tell for people who don't know, uh, kind of briefly explain what DMI is? Sure. Um, well, the dairy industry gets a lot of help from the government, the U.S. government, uh, to push its products. And regrettably, that's by law. Uh, the, US, uh, the U.S. law says that the government, specifically the Department of Agriculture, has to promote American agricultural products. And so they have a whole structure that does that for lots of products. But when you look at how much promotion these various products get, it's not at all even across the board. They're not out there pushing healthy fruits and vegetables and beans and that kind of stuff. Uh, dairy products get an enormous big push. And so the programs are called checkoff programs. And the idea is that the producers actually contribute a certain portion of their profits into a fund that goes for advertising and research and all kinds of promotional activities. But it's the U.S. government, your tax dollars at work, mm -hmm. um, that actually administer these programs. And so part of this is governmental and it's uh, part of it is also just turned over to to uh, more private organizations or quasi-governmental organizations. And one of them is DMI or Dairy Management Inc. Mm -hmm. So Dairy Management Inc. will work with McDonald's mm -hmm. or Taco Bell or Domino's and say, you know, if you would promote some more dairy by putting more cheese on that Domino's pizza, we'd all make more money. And uh, regrettably, the restaurants are happy to comply. Yeah, so I mean, speaking of all of the fast food partnerships, from what I understand, a lot of what we are able to know as a public about DMI and their operations are really thanks to you and PCRM, uh, specifically information that you guys were able to uncover in the early 2000s. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, back in 2001, we submitted some uh, FOIA, uh, FOIA requests, uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, yeah. asking for information about their activities. And what we got really surprised us, I have to say. We found not only that that these uh, the checkoff programs were making contracts uh, with fast food chains, but we got copies of the contracts themselves. We could see what they were actually doing. And it was astounding. Uh, DMI made uh, an arrangement with Wendy's 
to market the Wendy's Chever Cheddar Lovers Bacon Cheeseburger. And you think, wait a minute, is this the U.S. government at work? And it is, and they sold this product, and it sold a ton of cheese, mm -hmm. uh, a ton of cholesterol, a heck of a lot of saturated fat. Uh, they worked with Pizza Hut to produce the ultimate cheese pizza, which had an entire pound of cheese on one serving. Not making this up. They worked with Burger King. They've worked with McDonald's, as I said. They've worked with many of them. And they pour a fair amount of money into this. Uh, $12 million for Domino's mm -hmm. pizza. And the whole goal here is not to promote health. The law says that the, that the government must promote American agricultural products and it is irrespective of health. So a person might say, wait a minute, cheese has more salt and more, more, more sodium than potato chips. I mean, why are you promoting these products? That's the law. Uh, cheese and dairy products are the number one source of bad fat, saturated fat in the diet. Why are you promoting it? That's the law. So that's where we are. So that was in 2001 that we, yeah. we were able to expose that, but it kind of has gotten worse from there. Yeah, it certainly has. I I did a video last year about uh, Aubrey Plaza's Got Milk ad, and uh, that was really kind of the entry point for me in uncovering a lot of disturbing things about DMI. Um, and I knew from that episode of the uh, Cheese Trap, uh, the podcast episode, that you uh that DMI has to, or I don't know if they have to, but they post their press releases on their website. So I found a lot of uh, very mm -hmm. surprising things that I'm excited, some of which I want to ask you about later. Um, but uh, speaking of the uh, Aubrey Plaza Got Milk ad, uh, I know that PCRM ended up filing a complaint with the USDA in response to that ad. Um, I'd love to hear more about that and if there's any, if there were any updates on that. Um, they work really slowly, I have to say. Yeah. So we don't. I don't have an update there. Yeah. But but but, but that said, you can win um, through mm -hmm. the Freedom of Information Act years ago. Um, we found that the dairy industry was hatching a plan to try to say that if you drink milk, you'll lose weight. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, the science on this is shaky at best. I mean, <laughs> try it. You know, buy a carton of milk and see if you lose weight. Um, but they were. They thought that this was going to be the really kind of the touch point for lots of Americans. And they sunk a lot of money into it. So we did have to complain to the Federal Trade Commission okay. and say this kind of advertising is inappropriate. And the, Fed, the Federal Trade Commission took about two years to investigate okay. this. And they did something that's really uncomfortable for the government, which is to say that another branch of government is doing wrong. To their credit, that's what they did. They basically said these this advertising that you drink milk and you lose weight, mm -hmm. uh, which, which, by the way, had had uh, Dr. Phil... And lots of others saying, uh, drink milk, lose the weight, get yeah. real. Yeah. Um, it just it just didn't have a scientific basis. Mm -hmm. And to their credit, they, well, to the FTC's credit, they said, stop it. And DMI stopped it. I, and I wasn't a part of the complaint that you made that um, what the what they essentially were allowing the dairy checkoff to do with that ad was disparage other U.S. agricultural products. You know, it's one thing to say, drink drink our cow's milk, but it's quite another thing to say, don't drink soy milk, don't drink almond milk, right. don't drink these things because they taste like wood. That was kind of their whole ha-ha ad. It wasn't funny. Uh, nobody saw it as funny. People saw it as disparag disparaging. Yeah. Particularly, let's say you're uh, an African-American person where you uh, or an Asian person, a Native American person. In all of these populations, lactose intolerance is very, very common. Mm -hmm. Um if you're an African-American man, prostate cancer is extremely common and prostate cancer is strongly associated in many research studies with dairy intake. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have decided you're not gonna consume cow's milk and you're gonna instead put some almond milk in the refrigerator and you hope that your teenage kids will drink that instead. And now the US government has a program that's gonna make fun of you for making that choice. It's right. completely inappropriate. Right. Um, and I, I think that it, it just rang hollow with, mm -hmm. with viewers. Yeah. And I, I rather doubt that you'll see them do it again. But the, the point of it is they're chasing money. They are not trying to promote human health uh, at all. And unfortunately, when people chase money, they sometimes do things that you and I would not want to do.
Yeah, I mean, uh, the there was definitely a lot of backlash to that ad, especially on Aubrey Plaza's uh, own post where she posted it. It did get a lot of views, but it was you know just all negative comments uh, expressing disappointment in her. And she, I did notice that she ended up taking it down. I don't know exactly when. Uh, but uh, I just I think she just did not want that association uh, to live forever on her page, understandably. Uh, but, but you, you know, you're, you're bringing up a really good point here, though, that, that these people doing marketing are smart people. Mm -hmm. They recruit celebrities and celebrities often think maybe this will be a good thing for me. Um, maybe this will sound funny or they'll right. sound amusing and, and we'll be able to get some press out of it. Or a, a generation before that, it was the milk mustache ads. Right. People were lining up, all do a milk mustache right. and it'll get, you know, it'll be a really nicely done photograph and it'll it'll travel far and wide. And people did that. Um, and now of course they come to regret it. Um, and also despite, despite the fact that these um, programs, they get a lot of views, people see them, but that it has not translated into anything at the grocery store checkout. People right. are not buying more milk. They're buying less milk yeah. year after year after year. It's a complete real failure, right. um, despite the fact that it's a cultural icon. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I noticed when I went into researching for that video, I went in with so many questions and then I learned a lot, but I came out with even more questions. Uh, and one of the questions uh, that I you might have some type of answer to is the fact that there are so many different names for U.S. dairy organizations. Uh, just in the first paragraph of the DMI Wikipedia page, it says Dairy Management Inc. is funded by the U.S. Dairy Promotion Program, which also operates under the names Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy, American Dairy Association, National Dairy Council, and U.S. Dairy Export Council. <laughs> That's six different names just in the first paragraph. Uh, then Dairy Management Inc.'s website is usdairy.com. Mm -hmm. On there, it says Undeniably Dairy. And I know that when they partner with influencers, that's the name they partner under is Undeniably Dairy. Then you've got the Milk Processor Education Program. Uh, you've got, which also goes by the National Fluid Milk Processor Promotion Program and the Fluid Milk Checkout Program. That's 11 different names. I could keep going. Uh, I could spend our whole hour doing that. But uh, why are there so many different names? Like, are they actually all different organizations that do different things? Or is it just one organization with many different names? Okay. First of all, this will not be on the test. Um, <laughs> it, is, it is totally confusing. And part of this is there really are uh, a great many separate organizations doing much mm -hmm. the same thing. They started out at the state level and it, as many states as there are, there's that many yeah. uh, checkout programs. And then at the federal level, you have one for dairy overall and you have another one for fluid milk. That's the milk that's in a, yeah. in a carton. And there are, there are others too. And then you have the two sides of it. One is the governmental side. And then there's the non-governmental or sort of quasi-governmental side that does the actual work. That's where DMI comes in. So they got a million names. They all want to be in the press release and they mm -hmm. put all their names in there. Yeah. Um, and it is it is certainly confusing. Is it Would it be uh, too conspiratorial to say that it's intentionally confusing or is this just kind of how the government works? There's a million different organizations. It's how the government works. Um, and they're, and they're, you know, it, as shocking as it is for a consumer to see what they're doing behind the scenes and how they're really working to make you sick um, and to, pr to promote a product you do not need, mm -hmm. in their own universe, they are happy to brag about it. They want their partners to see what they're doing. They okay. want to tell people, here's what we're doing for you. We'll put mm -hmm. your organizational name in the press release so that you get recognized. Why? So the, the dairy farm organizations all appreciate you because they're kicking in the money for it. So right. uh, they're they're trying to give credit where credit is due, even though it's something that hmm. you and I would not want to see. Right. It kind of seems like a double edged sword of like it it behooves them to uh, brag about their accomplishments. But then it also uh, this leads me into talking about the the press releases on DMI's website. It it shows how, what good work they're doing in their mind, uh, but it also exposes to all of us what they're doing. <laughs> And the different, well, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't. No, yeah, that. go ahead. I, I was just going to say that a generation ago, let's say you were a dietitian or a dietetic student, and you could get a grant from the National Dairy Council 
That was like mom and apple pie. There was no criticism mm -hmm. of it at all. And that was right. a good thing. You could put that on your CV and you could brag about it. And so people wanted that association and the groups didn't feel a need to hide it at all. It was really right. open because the milk was viewed as a good source of calcium and it had protein and so forth. And it was only after that, that in observational studies, we start, started to see relationships with prostate cancer. Now we're seeing relationships with breast cancer, mm -hmm. which are, are harder to see in the population overall, but you do see it when you see uh, populations that avoid milk and those that eat a lot of it. Uh, we have two studies that are really quite disturbing with regard to breast cancer. Plus we have, I don't know if one would use the word smoking gun, but estradiol, which mm -hmm. is the female sex hormone, has, is, has been identified in milk. And it comes from the cow, Cows make this female sex hormone all the time, but because cows are kept pregnant fairly, relatively continuously mm -hmm. and are milked into their pregnancies, a lot of a lot more estradiol comes in than were they not kept pregnant. Mm -hmm. So the dairy industry doesn't want you to focus on that. And they are especially worried, not just about estradiol and it, its links with, with breast cancer because that's the big problem, but they're probably number one worry is that it's been really clear that saturated fat, bad fat, is linked to heart disease and linked to Alzheimer's disease. And the number two source is meat. The number one source is dairy. And they are expending a lot of effort to try to make that go away. Uh, they're trying to say, yes, there's saturated fat in milk, but ignore it, it won't hurt you. And they're really working hard to try to exonerate this toxic substance. So mm -hmm. that's the problem. And so as a result, it's much more controversial and people don't particularly want to get hooked uh, uh, hooked up with, with them in the same way as a generation ago. You could be an actor smoking a cigarette. This is my brand. No actor would do that now. Mm -mm. And I, I suspect you're going to see celebrities saying, I don't want to be hooked up with them the dairy industry for right. all the anti-environmental, anti-animal, anti-health, anti-minority thing uh, effects that it has. Right. Well, speaking of getting hooked up with uh, the dairy industry, I one of the things I was most shocked to find uh, on their on the DMI press release uh, section of their website, and most most people who have watched my video have also been shocked by this, is that the dairy. Uh, the dairy checkoff and uh, entered into a five-year partnership with the Mayo Clinic in 2022. Uh, the stated purpose was, you know, lots of different research uh, purposes, um, but the gist is that they wanted to uh, co-create content that will help debunk dairy myths and help consumers maintain confidence in dairy foods, farms, and businesses. Uh, the Mayo Clinic is a really trusted online resource. Uh, for medical information for the general public. So what are your thoughts on that as a doctor and why would the Mayo Clinic do that? Yeah, it's uh, very disturbing and I don't know what made them make this decision, but um, as you said, they're in a five-year uh, arrangement right. to uh, pr promote dairy products. I mean, there's no other way to say it because by law, right. the research that the checkout programs support is not health research. It is not there to make you healthier. It's not to help you make wiser choices. It is there specifically to promote an economic demand for the product. That's what the law requires the government to do. So if they've hooked with Mayo, that's what Mayo's got to do. Um, and so they will do research to try to look at what, what it is that makes uh, saturated fat not seem so bad. And the risk, of course, that what everyone's concerned about is that they're going to be using their good name for bad science. Right. And you, and, which you can do. I mean, the egg industry has has done this for a long time. Eggs are loaded with cholesterol, so the egg, there's an egg checkoff, um, and so they will fund studies that are, say, a rather small study. So you'll show a rise in cholesterol, but it's not statistically significant because you didn't have very many people, and then so you can then do a press release saying that mm -hmm. eggs cause only a minor rise in cholesterol or they'll compare it to spam or something like that and show that eggs aren't worse than other foods. And, and so they, they've done a huge number of studies and now the dairy people are, are in this. Um, one wonders if the Mayo Clinic will uh, at some point be referred to as the Mayonnaise Clinic. I don't know, I hope not. I but uh, for, for right now, I, I think it, it really looks like something that they would wanna get out of. Right, and I mean, I, I would assume that there is some exchange of money happening, right? Like that's what this is. It's a fund that that they use to help 
promote dairy to the public. So uh, Mayo researchers are not going to be doing work for free. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my hope is that they will not continue to do this. And let me say that there are terrific doctors at the Mayo Clinic. All right, um, of there are, are many people I've spoken there many times. I have, I'm going to be speaking there again in May. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad to work with our friends at Mayo. Yeah. Um, so whoever got the idea of working up with industry, I'm not quite sure. You know, here at the Physicians Committee, we get this all the time. The Physicians yeah. Committee for Responsible Medicine, food companies want to work with us because we do research. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of work and we don't take money from any food company. Yeah. Whether they're a bad company or a good company or a rich company, or poor, we don't we don't do it um, because if we're saying broccoli is good, it can't be because we took five bucks from the broccoli industry. I mean, you have to do your work independent of economics. Yeah, and and it's it's one thing for them to partner up, I guess, but uh, I'm guessing there will be absolutely no transparency to the public if there's an article posted on the Mayo Clinic about you know dairy actually isn't as bad as people say it is, or you know I who knows what the article may be, but I would guess there's not going to be anything at the bottom that says this uh, article or this study was uh, was published with support from the dairy checkoff. Um, Let's let's look and see. Yeah, it's it was an inter interesting thing when the egg industry was uh, was so involved in this. It was actually they were working toward the 2015 dietary guidelines for Americans. The egg industry planned its research studies to have results that came out just before the government was going to revise the guidelines, and they wanted the 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 government to say eggs are okay, the cholesterol right. won't, hurt, won't hurt you. Yeah, and I, I'm happy to tell you they failed at mm. that. The government did not say that. Yeah, uh, but they they work really hard to try to do that. The papers that come out do say in the fine print who funded it, and they often did the research um, in a way where you can you can tease apart the results. And even the industry funded egg studies showed that eggs raise cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Now, when they had a chance to to write their discussion and their conclusions, they might try to soft pedal it and say, mm -hmm. well, the rise in cholesterol wasn't too high or, mm. or could have been chance or something like that. But the funding is clear and the, and the findings are pretty clear too. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll just have to keep our eye on that one and see. Um, in terms of transparency in general with these DMI partnerships, I, I, what I think is particularly insidious is, okay, so they partner up with Taco Bell or they partner up with, with Wendy's and whoever else. Uh, but when people watch a Taco Bell commercial for the grilled cheese stuffed burrito, which was the result of one of their partnerships, people realize they're watching a Taco Bell commercial, but they don't realize that they're also watching a dairy industry commercial. And I just, I feel like I would, it would feel a little bit more like a level playing field if there did have to be some type of disclosure in the ad. I mean, maybe there is in the tiny fine print at the bottom. I don't, I don't really read that. I don't think anybody does. Uh, but is there anything that can be done about that transparency or do you think that will ever change? Yeah, they're not obligated by law to disclose um, DMI's involvement mm -hmm. in their television advertising. And they, and as you said, they don't. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, it, and it's quite insidious and creative when they work with uh, say a, a, a pizza company they're trying to figure out ways to put more cheese on their pizza. They don't care if you eat it or not, they just want to sell it. And so you can only put so much cheese on top of the pizza. So they'll, they'll have to give it a name that makes it sound really good or really indulgent, or they take pizza. And over the past 10 years or so, they've been sticking it not just on top, but in the crust. They'll okay. infuse it in parts of the, of the yeah. pizza, which you think, what are you doing? What's the point of that? Yeah. You know, a generation ago or two generations ago, when you get a salad, it didn't have cheese on the salad. The salad was lettuce and tomatoes and cucumbers. Mm. Now they put it there. So they're just throwing it in, kind of anywhere that they that they can. Yeah. And th that's really uh, unfortunate. Yeah. I don't know. This is just like an ongoing vegan frustration. There's memes about it. It's a big talking point. I kind of know the answer, but I'd love to hear what you say about this. Why is milk powder in absolutely everything in the grocery store? You know, a big one that vegans always complain about is the uh, garden uh, garden salsa flavor of Sun Chips. There's no milk in salsa. Why is there milk powder in so much packaged food? Um, I'm not sure that I really know the answer to that, but it's it could be for two reasons. One is that it actually adds something to to the food that the 
that people may, making it right. appreciate. Um, the other is that milk powder is something that you can store. Um, mm -hmm. If you're the dairy industry and you can only sell so much milk, you can't keep liquid milk around for a particularly long period of time, but you yeah. can dehydrate it and you've got powdered milk and you can store that for a long period of time. It becomes uh, a marketable product. And if somebody will buy it for cheap for you, fair enough. I mean, that's yeah. more money in the bank. I have to yeah. say all these issues are not going to get better anytime soon. And one reason is a peculiarity in the United States um, because uh, this is an election year. And so people know California is likely to go blue, you know, and some other states are likely to go red. Um, the, the states where the both political parties are aiming are the swing states. They could go either way. They have a big agricultural lobby and nobody wants to irritate them. Nobody wants to, to take those voters away. So you are not likely to see uh, mm -hmm. the government come out and say, you know, dairy is actually linked to prostate cancer, and it's the and they won't say uh, it's the number one source of saturated fat. They'll 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 hide these things uh, mm -hmm. or obscure them and make it harder to uh, harder to to see. And in fact, one of the biggest scandals right now, the dietary guidelines for Americans, which is the blueprint for the school lunches and everything mm -hmm. else, yeah. they're being reformed or reformulated. Mm -hmm. If you look at the the current one, that's their starting point. It it does not say that saturated fats number one source is dairy which is the fact mm -hmm. it says the number one source is sandwiches and you think sandwiches the bread doesn't oh. have any saturated the bread doesn't have any saturated fat in it the tomato and lettuce don't have any saturated fat in it the ketchup or mustard don't it's only in the cheese yeah. and the meat inside the sandwich right but that's that's their way of 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 hiding this and they'll say that that uh, rice desserts are a major source of saturated fat. There's no saturated fat in rice. It's if you put cream in it, that's yeah. where it is. So the, my yes. point being that the government tries to hide these things. And because of politics, they continue to do that. Mm. But the good news is we're, we are not beholden to, to the government to make our choices. We learn about these things. We make our choices and they can't push this down your throat. And that is why we have been winning for a long period of time that mm. this is why the dairy case doesn't look like it looked 15 mm. years ago we're yeah. winning this uh quite decisively yeah it's definitely encouraging to see um speaking of the dairy case this is this is something that i have noticed in the last couple of years i don't know if there's anything here but it feels very suspicious to me so i have noticed at whole foods in particular in the past two or so years uh, I will be shopping in the produce section and I'll be looking at uh, some tomatoes and then I start smelling something kind of uh, uh, funky and uh, and sour. And I'm like, what is that smell? And I look up and there's a big display of cheese right in the middle of the tomatoes. I have been noticing in the produce section, um, it's pretty much every time I've been to the store in the last two years, Whole Foods specifically, that the cheese is now making its way into the produce section. Usually it will be with the uh, tomatoes and the basil and they're trying to kind of like tell a little story, I suppose. Um, but I have to think it's to try to sell more cheese. And I wonder if there could be DMI involvement there. It's possible. I don't know. You know, the people who run Whole Foods are smart people and by and large are doing a good job of promoting mm. good and healthy things. But every grocery store, every every retailer, they know their business. And mm. so uh, everything is for sale in a way. What is at eye level versus what's down here and, and up right. here? I mean, they um, and, and all the people who want to have their products have prime placement in the store. They are fighting tooth and nail and they're talking with management mm -hmm. about why is my vegan cheese uh, not on your shelf or why is it mm -hmm. over here? Why is it in this department, not in that department? So right. these these are all major decisions for them. Um, yeah. And the bottom line is what gets to the cashier. Yeah, right. Uh, just a ge kind of a general question. Uh, how do you think the dairy industry is doing overall? What do you see the next few years looking like for them? It seems like they've had some wins in the last few years, also some losses. Uh, what do you think is the in the near future for the dairy industry? I think they're going to continue to lose ground um, overall. Um, and that's really because, number one, people are recognizing the problems with it. And the problems, I think, started out with health. 
uh, saturated fats, a big one. And, and this has gone on for since the 60s. People started taking the fat out of dairy right. uh, because they know it's got a problem. They're trying to fight back because because they they want to sell that fat. They don't want to just take it out and throw it in a landfill. They want to sell it either as cheese or as whole milk. In fact, there's a bill in Congress right now to say to to push whole milk and to fight back and say that whole milk ought to be served to kids in schools. Um, but I think they're going to continue to lose ground because people are aware of the health risks to it. And as people are aware of the estrogens that are in cow's milk, people think, I'm not sure I really want that anymore. So that's continuing. In addition to that, the environmental argument is gaining ground as well. Right. I mean, you really have to live in a cave to not think that the climate is, if you're, if you're thinking the climate isn't changing. Yeah. And if you've got, what, 80 million belching cows or whatever it is, um, in the United States at any given time, they're dairy cows and meat and, and cows for beef. Um, and they are belching methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse chemical and people are yes. aware of that. Yes. The third the third thing is, I think that people are aware of the suffering of the animals themselves. Mm -hmm. It used to be that you could say, well, the cow gives you milk, but only more recently are people aware that the cows are artificially inseminated in a rather crude way. When their calves are, are born, mm -hmm. Um, the calf is not hanging out with mom. The calf is killed if he's a male uh, quite soon after birth for veal. And the females are taken away from the mothers and they're raised in isolation until they're ready to be inseminated. And all the people who didn't want to eat meat because the animals are killed have come to recognize that the dairy cows are killed too. Yeah. Um, a cow in nature lives to be about 20, but on a dairy farm by age four, they're, they are hung up by a leg and their throat is slit. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of these rather creepy things that have come out about the industry and, and its machinations behind the scene have tainted a lot of people. Plus, let's face it, the, the competition is winning like crazy. So, soy milk, yeah. which is kind of the original, mm -hmm. reduces cancer risk. Um, people have tried to, to confuse that by saying, no, soy does not increase cancer risk. Uh, it's the opposite. Soy reduces breast cancer risk, reduces prostate cancer risk. Um, then almond milk came in and all of these others. And these are good products mm -hmm. and they're tasty and they don't upset your stomach. So, so I think they're going to continue to lose ground. The, the big area though, they're continuing to fight for cheese and they're mm -hmm. fighting for overseas markets. So mm -hmm. that uh, okay. 40 years ago, 50 years ago, you weren't seeing Japanese people, Chinese people, Thai right. people, Vietnam, Vietnamese people consuming a lot of dairy. There's a huge push for yeah. them to consume dairy and also to consume meat. Uh, pork products from here in America yeah. consumed uh, in Asia. So yeah. stay tuned. Yeah, I was, well, I was going to ask you uh, if there's anything we should be kind of keeping our eyes on, anything new that DMI is up to that we should be aware of or things that you're starting to see happen. And and uh, you you sort of just answered that, but anything else? Well, you'll continue to see it as, as you as you pointed out. If you see an ad, if you see the product placement in a movie, yeah. this is not by chance. Right. Um, so you'll see it. But yeah. once you've seen through it, it's like going to a magic show where you already know the dumb trick the magician's going to do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work a second time. It's so true. Uh, <laughs> um, and that's what, you know, I think just talking about it in this way, that's why it's so important. Uh, I want to talk about your book. Uh, it comes out March 26th and it's called The Power Foods Diet, the breakthrough plan that traps, tames, and burns calories for easy and permanent weight loss. It has more than 120 recipes and beautiful food photography and shows the surprising ability that certain foods to have to cause weight loss. Um, I'd love to hear from you why this book was so important to you to write at this time. It's probably the most fun book I've ever written because up until now, people think, all right, if I want to lose weight, I've got to not eat this, and I've got to not eat that, and I've got to cut calories, and, and it's, it's sort of a, yeah. a, a deprivation is the idea. But over the past decade or so, the literature has come out that certain foods, if you add them to your routine, people will lose weight. And uh, I want to give a lot of credit to my friends at Harvard, who in 2015 did a study on more than 100,000 people. And they found that there were certain foods where if you tended to eat them more and more, the scale was just kind of going down and down and down. And there were a number of them. Uh, berries was top of the list, blueberries, strawberries, mm -hmm. raspberries. Um, and then number two was the cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and cauliflower. 
Number three was green vegetables in general, including things like spinach. And then number, number four was melon, watermelon, cantaloupe. And number five, citrus fruits. And then number six was the whole bean group, beans, peas, and lentils. Mm -hmm. and, and there are there are many others. But other researchers have jumped in and said, wait a minute, we can actually put this to the test. And researchers in the UK did an amazing thing. I mentioned berries being at the top of the list at, at Harvard. Yeah. Blueberries, that blue color comes from what are called anthocyanins. That's that's the blue color in a blueberry. Mm -hmm. And it's there are variants of anthocyanins that make strawberries red. Yeah. And so in the UK, scientists brought together almost 3,000 twins. And they did DEXA scanning. A DEXA scanner looks at where the body fat is on your body. And what they found is within each twin pair, the one who consumed the most anthocyanins had about 9% less abdominal fat compared to her sister who was genetically identical to her. Mm. And so we started to see, wait a minute, there's, there's a whole bunch of foods that have this effect. So just real quick, blueberries, all the ones I mentioned, certain spices like cinnamon. Cinnamon will mm. ramp up your appetite, uh, ramp up your metabolism yeah. for an hour or so after the meal. So I thought, all right, what if, instead of focusing so much on, here are the things you aren't going to eat, what if I give you a recipe for French toast? And it's going to have a blueberry syrup on top. And it'll have some cinnamon on it. And I take all the bad stuff out so it's not loaded with calories. Can this be a slimming food? And the answer is, it absolutely can. And so, the, as you mentioned, there are lots of recipes and lots of tips for people who are a little allergic to cooking, which is more and more of us. Mm -hmm. And it's really fun because I explain how the power foods work, how they affect your appetite, your metabolism and so forth. And then we just put them to work and the weight loss is effectively automatic. Yeah. I mean, when I, as soon as I found out that the book was about, you know, for focused on weight loss, I immediately thought of obviously Ozempic and all of the weight loss drugs that have just been become so popular. And then I was happy to see that you mentioned Ozempic, uh, and all of those other drugs on the first page, and you actually go uh, pretty in depth into all of those. Um, who would you say is like, uh, who would you love to walk into a bookstore and pick this book up and buy it? Like, who are you hoping to reach with this book? Well, I think the people who are already, I mean, it's, it's already being pre-ordered on Amazon and you'll see it's, it's quite popular, even though it, has, it hasn't come out yet. Yeah. Um, the, I, th I think that the people who are really desperate for this are, are the people who have been hurting themselves. Mm -hmm. um, people who, who wanted to lose weight. Uh, their doctor might've told them that their, uh, their risk of diabetes and so forth will go down if they're able to lose some weight, but they're not sure how. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the doctor might naively say, well, um, you're eating 1800 calories. Why don't you cut it down to 1300? So you're 500 calories less every day by, by forcing yourself. And by Wednesday, you're ready to eat the sofa. I mean, you just, you just don't feel good or don't uh, go on a ketogenic diet. So don't eat carbohydrate. So then you feel guilty if you have a piece of fruit or a sweet potato or a piece of bread or anything with carbohydrate and you're told you're bad. And this becomes physically harmful because over the long run, these diets don't work very well. Um, and you, you can hurt yourself, but it becomes psychologically terrible because, oh, the people in the ad did great, but I'm not succeeding. So maybe I've got willpower problems. And so I, if, if we can first realize you are not, a, you, this is not your problem. This is not yeah. your fault. Yeah. It's the fault of bad diets that have been pushed on you. You thought it was going to work. Well, it doesn't work very well for most people. Um, yeah. And secondly, if you put the right foods on your plate. They'll do the work for you. They'll, they'll do the work for you. We have three categories. We have foods that tame your appetite so that you fill up, but with maybe a couple of hundred calories less than you would have eaten had you filled up with cheese or salmon. Um, and uh, you could trap calories in your digestive tract with certain foods so that you never absorb them at all. They come up with the waste. You would literally flush them down the toilet. It's the most remarkable thing. And you can knock about a hundred calories off just doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and then your metabolism will increase for three or four hours after the meal, depending on what you've eaten. That's good for another couple, couple of hundred calories. And you put it together and the weight loss is so easy and so rewarding. And you rebuild 
your self-confidence. That's one thing I loved about the book is there was so much compassion behind it. And I loved all of the real people stories that you shared and that you told. I think it really uh, showcases how much of what you do is really to help people. And, uh, you know, especially people, like you said, that have been uh, struggling for so long. And um, I really enjoyed the book a lot, even as someone who's not actively trying to lose weight. I think there's something for everyone in there. Uh, there's so much good nutrition information and also like the chapter about the weight loss drugs and even some, you know, questionable things that are that are happening in that regard, like with the uh, 60 minute segment, which was pretty shocking. Um, one thing I wanted to ask when, you know, you talked about how confused people are. I, I believe you said this again in that Cheese Trap uh, podcast episode, which I'm going to link to uh, in my description so people can uh, listen to it. But I, I think you mentioned how uh, conf there's so much confusion, right? Like, oh, uh, this person says this is going to make me fat. This person says that's going to make me fat. One person's telling me this is healthy and another person's telling me it's going to kill me. And I I uh, recall you saying that that is sort of a, a strategy of the dairy industry. Like for them, confusion is good. Confusion of like, oh, I, you know, I, I, can't, I can't seem to get it right. So I'm just going to eat whatever I want. That that is almost like a, a tactic of some of the animal agriculture industries. Confusion went. Um, if, if there's an issue, uh, do, do cigarettes cause cancer? If you could sow a seed of doubt, you don't have to show yeah. that they don't have cancer. You just have to allow people to be confused or uncertain because then the addictive qualities will win out. Um, yeah. But th the good news is, is that I think things have become clearer. But the population still is confused and we're not too sure what to, what to think. Um, right. Because also there's, a, I think, a very good movement, which is to say, also, we shouldn't be so worried about appearance and size and things and we shouldn't be discriminating yeah. uh, on that basis. And that's that's really true. Um, and yet at the same time, there are some people who are thinking, well, yeah, I, I don't want to feel bad about my size, but at the same time, I don't want to be at risk for an illness either. And if, and if, if certain foods will help me to be in the size and shape and body, that's maybe right for me, um, let me try and take advantage of them. Mm -hmm. And so I think if we could maybe set aside some of these discussions and just look at how foods work and then let you decide, you can decide to take advantage of them as much or as little as you like. Mm -hmm. And what people tend to feel is personal power, mm -hmm. that they can now make a, a real choice, which they couldn't make before. They have, they also have more energy. Their numbers for cholesterol and blood pressure and everything tend to get, get better and better. Plus, maybe the most important thing is, is this. If you're on um, a calorie counting diet, you know, I'm only gonna eat 800 calories a day. You're not going to share that with your family. You're not going to say everyone around here is eating 800 calories a day. <laughs> if you're on Ozempic or Wagovi, you're not going to share your injections around either. Mm. But if you make Dustin Harder's berry pops or the pasta rabiata or my French toast or, or all of these foods, you can share them. And the most important people to share them is, again, the youngest generation so that they have a taste yeah. for foods that really love them back and allow them to grow up in a healthy way rather than grow up at risk, which is what we're doing with the generation right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's wonderful. It is uh, something that can be so, so sh beautiful and shared in that way, which I think is great. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about uh, so much of the like the whole food plant-based protocols and a lot of the uh, plant-based doctors that, that are well-known, um, so much of what people advocate for is, you know, no oil or very little oil. And I understand oil having, you know, a lot of calories per gram. Uh, is that mostly for people who are trying to lose weight or for people who are just trying to, you know, eat a healthy diet and maintain, uh, their overall health is oil really, uh, that bad? Great question. Um, oil beats the socks off of butter. Mm -hmm. and lard. It's much better. No question about it. Um, however, oil, if for the if for the reason you gave, it's really as dense in calories as every other. Typical oil, typical plant oils don't have a lot of saturated fat in them, so they don't raise your cholesterol very much. 
And some like say olive oil, because it came from an olive, it has polyphenols in it that have health benefits themselves. However, because it's so high in calories when it's in the oil form, I started to think of oils in a little bit different way. Think, think of this, let's say as an analogy, I take some sugar cane and I'm gonna chew on some sugar cane. It has a nice sweet taste. How much sugar am I actually gonna eat? Well, it's gonna be limited because the sugar cane is really fibrous and has a, you know, there's only so much you can do. What if I have a factory that throws away all the fiber and all the pulp and concentrates the sugar? How much can I eat now? A huge amount. Okay, olives. How many olives can you eat at a sitting? Three, four, five, eight or nine? Let's say I invent a factory that presses out the oil, throws all the pulp and all the fiber out. Now, how many calories worth of olive oil can go down my gullet? A lot, a huge amount. Mm -hmm. So I know it sounds funny to describe oil as a refined food, mm -hmm. but even if they call it virgin, it still is. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I, th I think that's something that I hear a lot of vegans kind of be confused about is the the no oil part of the of the whole food plant base, but that that really helps to clear things up. Um, so well, where where it matters, let me answer your question really with this. Where it matters is a person who's trying to lose weight, a person who has diabetes and they're trying to get it better because our goal with diabetes is to get the fat out of your muscle and liver cells. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And for those populations, that's where it matters a lot. Also, for anybody with a hormonal issue, let's say a young woman has bad cramps, mm -hmm. me menstrual cramps, or endometriosis, fertility issues, oils mess up your hormones like crazy. And mm -hmm. if you don't believe me, just try, or, or a woman at menopause who's having hot flashes that are driving her insane. You um, plant-based diet, keep the oils to an absolute minimum, and you're going to see the benefit. Hmm. That's interesting. That's something I hadn't really thought about before. Um, so, so much more, uh, so much more interesting, uh, insight and so much knowledge in the book. It's out March 26. People can pre-order it now, and I'm assuming they can buy it wherever books are sold. Yeah. Um, on, on March 26, it'll be everywhere. And it'll, including if you order it now on Amazon, it'll be at your door on March 26. And we're going to be, we're starting a book club here at PCRM in advance of that, uh, which is also free. And I hope people will join us. And I'm glad to talk about it because it's, it's as I say, it's a really fun, effective and, uh, and uh, guilt-free way for people to lose a lot of weight and to really feel good about themselves. I agree. And I, I really hope that a lot of people will pick this up and, and learn something from it. Um, other than the book, where can people hear more from you? Oh, well, thank you for asking. Here at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, our website is pcrm.org. And we've got videos all over YouTube and everywhere else that I hope people will have a look at as well. Yes. And I highly recommend the Exam Room podcast, mm -hmm. which you are on uh, very often. And uh, it's just so... So interesting to hear from you. I know that you're super busy preparing with the launch of the book, and I so appreciate you taking time to join me. You are a wealth of information, and I think not just the vegan community, but the community at large is really lucky to have you. Well, right back at you. I want to thank you for what you do, because you have a way to reach people and share information that is really good and helpful, and you'll never know how many lives you save, but you'll intrigue people and... and uh, that can save lots of lives. So thank you for what you do. Thank you so much. That's that's lovely. Thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Barnard. All right. Look forward to doing it again sometime. Thanks. I'd love that. I really hope you guys enjoyed that interview as much as I did. He was such a pleasure to talk to. So easy to talk to. Honestly, just a dream interviewee, if I'm being honest. Give this video a thumbs up if you learned something new from it. Comment down below letting me know what your favorite part of the interview was. And just a reminder that I'll be going live tomorrow, Friday, March 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern on my channel. I am so looking forward to that. I hope to see a lot of you guys there. And that's it for today. Subscribe for more of my videos. Hit the bell to be notified when I upload. And I'll see you again soon. Bye.